in the name of almighty allah the most gracious and the most merciful revered chief guest of the function professor mt bande respected guest of honor professor roman arganta workshop director our beloved head of the division professor ari shahardar various heads of the divisions scientists faculty members participants and students assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you myself dr shahana riaz trambu guest faculty division of veterinary parasitology i am honored to welcome you all to this workshop on advancing one health strategies for combating vector borne diseases together we gather here in the spirit of bold determination and unwavering commitment to address one of the most pressing challenges of our time the battle against vector borne diseases i'm truly honored to stand before you all as we inaugurate the workshop on one health strategies a crucial step in our collective journey towards a healthier and a safer future together we have the power to turn the tide against vector borne diseases let this workshop be the spark that ignites a wildfire of change let us be bold in our resolve relentless in our pursuit and unwavering in our belief that a world free from these diseases is not just a dream but a reality we can and we will create now i invite uh, the coordinator of this workshop dr k h bulbul to please deliver the formal welcome address thank you shahana excellencies dignitaries distinguished delegates scientists student friends ladies and gentlemen present here assalamu alaikum and good afternoon i welcome all of you to this event i dr kamal hasan bulbul on behalf of division of veterinary parasitology welcome you to the workshop entitled advancing on one health strategies for combating vector borne disease we heartily welcome the honorable chief guest professor mohammad tufel bande dean faculty of veterinary science and animal husbandry for accepting our invitation and gracing the occasion despite him being very busy with national symposium of which who is an organizing secretary it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome our special guest dr roman r genta professor university of mysore colombia usa for accepting our invitation for delivering an expert lecture in this event we also welcome dr suhasini genta spouse of dr roman who is working as a senior scientist at university of mysore usa we welcome professor rafiq ahmed shardar head division of veterinary parasitology for gracing the occasion and guiding us organizing this workshop we also welcome professor azmat alam khan co pi idp nehf for parting this event we also welcome different heads of the uh, division professors and scientists for taking part this event it is my honor more than a pleasure to welcome all the vela participants from various reputed institutes of valley for joining us to success this 
auspicious event. We also welcome personnel from press and media for covering the event. Last, not but the least, I welcome all those who contribute to make the today's workshop a grand success. I believe this work will help you to make bridges for collaborative institutional program for the benefit of living size. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, may I invite Professor Ari Shahardar, Head Division of Veterinary Parastology, to felicitate the chief guest of today's function, Professor M.T. Bande, with the bouquet. Thank you, sir. Now I request Professor M.T. Bande to felicitate our guest of honor, Professor Roman R. Ganta, Professor University of Missouri, Columbia, USA, with a bouquet and a token of love from the organizers. Thank you, sir. Our guest of honor is also accompanied by his spouse, Dr. Suhasini Ganta, working as senior scientist in University of Missouri, Columbia, USA. I request Professor Azmat Alam Khan to present the bouquet and a shawl to Dr. Suhasini Ganta. Thank you, sir. Now, may I invite uh, Dr. Khurshid Ahmed to felicitate our head of the division, uh, Professor Ari Shahardar, with the bouquet. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Dr. Idris Maharaj Alai to felicitate Professor Azmat Alam Khan with the bouquet. Thank you, sir. Now, may I invite the organizing secretary of today's program, Dr. Idris Maharaj Alai, to present the program overview. Respected chief guest of this event, Dean Faculty of Veterinary Sciences, Professor Tufel Saab, guest of honor, Professor Roman Ganta, and his spouse, Professor Sohasri, who is also working in the University of Missouri, USA. Program Director Rafiq Ahmad Shahardar Saab, Co PI Neheb, Dr. Azmat Alam Khan, dear participants, my colleagues, and various heads of the divisions. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. First of all, please accept my hand folded apologies for changing this event and this was supposed to be held in the morning and now we are in the afternoon session so in the morning i hope you have enjoyed the afternoon session and now in the afternoon session we will enjoy the morning session so that was not in our hands because of the delay in the flight this program got little bit rather not little bit i should say it got flipped <laughs> so now this workshop is basically about the vectors. These vectors are very important and play a crucial role in the transmission of 
various pathogenic organisms between animals humans or from animals to humans or vice versa and if you will see these vector borne diseases are highly suited to one health concept for combating infectious diseases the ever increasing population growth rate and climate change has led to the ecological disturb equilibrium causing vector borne spill overs because of the urbanizations and because of the uh, these urbanizations take place because of the increase in the population and because of the global warming there are more frequent contacts of these vectors now with the humans or the animals with the result there are every possibility of transmission of these diseases among these human beings or these uh, animals and in between them and uh, if we will see about why we have chosen this topic for this uh, event in this kashmir previously in this kashmir we were not having hemoprotozoan diseases and if they were reported they were reported at very low rate but from last few years we are seeing that there is surge of these hemoprotozoan diseases and the dynamics of these ectoparasites vectors is also changing because of the global warming which we are this time witnessing that this kashmir was not having this type of climate during september it used to be relatively cool so this can be the hypothesis that is why we thought that we should work in this aspect and law from last two to three years our department is focusing on these vector borne diseases although i am a man of helminthology but because of this uh, fascinating uh, this change which fascinated me to go into these vector borne diseases and from our department we isolated some of the hemoprotozoans from the ticks as well as from the domestic animals uh, these hemoprotozoans and in uh, our kashmir valley we have the first report from the northern india of babesha bovis which we characterized in our department also and it's only the second report from india because usually throughout india we will we are seeing babesha bijamina but babesha bovis cases are not seen in the india so that fascinated us to go more into this vector biology and uh, because of these things apparent, uh, we thought of how to go for the strategic control of these vector borne diseases because if now we are getting these uh, uh, hemoprotozoan diseases because of global warming and change in the dynamics of these tick populations we may in future uh, face the other vector borne diseases so in order to have a concrete strategic plan beforehand so that we can control or prevent those vector borne diseases which are limited to some areas and they can be shifted to this area because of mobility of human populations and because of other factors so the only concept is one health concept which will save us from those vector borne diseases from going into the uh, red zone in this area so a paradigm shift to one health concept is necessary to win the global fight and prevent the emergence and spread of vector borne diseases to new areas so this was the uh, theme which we have selected for this event and for this i am highly thankful to professor roman ganta who accepted our invitation to deliver a talk about these vector borne diseases at this very faculty so giving this uh, overview of this uh, program i think uh, we are having participants in this from uh, different uh, universities we are having participants from government medical college srinagar we are having participants from sikkim srinagar animal and sheep husbandry department wildlife department of faculty of forestry we are having research scholars from kashmir university and faculty of veterinary sciences the nature of participants itself speaks about the importance of one health and need for the collaborations between the stakeholders for a healthier planet i am sure that we will we all will have a meaningful and enriching session with dr roman and i believe that this workshop will help us explore channels for collaboration and networking with different institutions and one health leaders which are there 
working in this area. So before I will take leave from this day, I will just uh, request their participants to introduce, give a brief, brief introduction about themselves, just name and institution. Just starting from. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request Professor Azmat Alam Khan, co PI IDP Nahab, to present the brief about IDP Nahab activities. Assalamu alaikum and uh, very good afternoon. Uh, I'll be very brief uh, because uh, I have been telling uh, since uh, many programs now that uh, we are having these one day programs or two day programs. Kindly, 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 please uh, uh, stick to the business. Uh, don't go for these inaugurals and valedictories. In a one day program, once you are going for this inaugural program, then uh, this we, we lose precious time. Uh, since I have been told to t uh, tell you something about NAHEP, just for the, our guest, sir, uh, this uh, we have a national agriculture higher education project. It is World Bank funded project uh, uh, run by ICAR, Indian Council for Agriculture Research. Uh, they are uh, they mean uh, to transform this uh, agricultural education bring in new things to the agricultural education this is the aim and uh, under this program uh, we have uh, we do two three very important things first we want to give international exposure to our students as well as faculty in that uh, case we have sent as many as 50 teachers from this university uh, to uh, various overseas uh, institutions uh, for uh, trainings for uh, different durations for the young scientists who are uh, less than 40 years of age we prefer a longer duration of training maybe up to six months also and uh, for the middle age uh, scientists we prefer some one or two months of training and uh, the uh, oldies like me uh, we have some 15 days of uh, exposure overseas exposure similarly we uh, uh, we send our undergraduate students this is probably uh, probably for the first time these undergraduate students are also sent for overseas exposure this is a new thing in agriculture and uh, we have uh, sent some uh, 50 plus students from different disciplines uh, 
to various overseas institutions like uh, we have sent them to australia we have sent them to thailand we are sending a batch shortly to china uh, so this process is going on plus we are inviting various international uh, uh, experts to our uh, faculty uh, we are inducting many experts as our uh, adjunct faculty or the professors of practice we call them uh, they uh, come to us so that we have we add diversity to our uh, teaching faculty uh, plus there are a lot of programs we organize entrepreneurship we uh, promote the ecosystem of innovations incubation startups etc we have uh, done a very good thing in the those innovations and startups and it is probably uh, i myself attribute it to nahab that we are now ranked as the fourth best state agriculture university in country and this is the only state agriculture university that has been ranked in uh, by uh, nirf in innovation innovation ranking this is the only state agriculture university in that ranking plus uh, only uh, university in this region in jammu and kashmir we have some um, more than 10 universities 10 11 universities among all those 10 universities this is the only university that is that has been ranked for its innovations so these are some of the things which have been doing and many more things we do but uh, i don't want to lose the precious time we have a very revered expert among us uh, we should headlong jump into the uh, the his uh, um, we like to hear uh, from the expert thank you very much thank you sir now may i invite the most humble and dynamic senior professor of our faculty our workshop director professor ari shahardar for his address Your time. <clears throat> the chief guest of today's function, Professor M.T. Bondi, Dean Faculty of Veterinary Sciences. Our guest of honor, Dr. Roman Venta, Professor of Pathobiology, College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Missouri, Columbia, USA. <clears throat> My colleagues, distinguished faculty members, participants, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate my colleagues who worked meticulously for organizing this workshop at a very short notice. This is the, one of the most important things because they had to organize this workshop within one day. So they, they made very meticulous efforts. Our thanks are also to Professor M.T. Bande, Dean Veterinary of Faculty Sciences. Dean Faculty of Veterinary Sciences, without whose wholehearted support, it would have not have been possible to conduct this workshop. I also express my deep sense of gratitude to our guest of honor, Professor Roman Ganta, for accepting our invitation to deliver the expert lecture on vector vector borne diseases of global importance bridging building bridges from basic research applications so i am very happy to see the participation of scientists academicians researchers from various disciplines which are and who are working locally, nationally, and globally to achieve the optimum health conditions for humans, animals, plants, as well as environment, which is the main goal of one health. And I am very happy to see the participation of various members from medical fraternity which is a very clear-cut indication that we have started 
coming out of our watertight compartments to share the common platforms of knowledge and wisdom. And I would also like to give the brief introduction about our department of parasitology. Our department is mandated with three main assignments. The first assignment is the teaching. The second assignment is the research. And third assignment is the extension. Regarding teaching, we are teaching parasitology at undergraduate level, at doctor's level, as well as at doctor's level. And regarding the research, we have conducted epidemiological studies on parasitic fauna of all species of livestock in Kashmir Valley. And on the basis of that, we have evolved parasiticidal schedule for the livestock of Kashmir Valley, which is being followed in letter and supreme by the developmental departments to control the parasitic diseases in livestock. In addition to this, we are conducting research on immunological and molecular diagnosis of parasitic diseases. And we have, are also working out the status of development of resistance by the parasites against enzymatics, antiprotozoals, insecticides, and acaricides. And we have generated huge data regarding the status of development of resistance in different regions of the Kashmir Valley. And we have advised accordingly the developmental departments which drugs to be used and which drugs not to be used in near future. Regarding extension, we are creating awareness among us to the farmers by delivering TV talks and by delivering radio talks, as well as by conducting training programs for para vets, veterinarians, as well as for farmers. With this brief introduction, I would like to thank all of you for patient listening. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, you are really an asset to our department. Your efforts at strengthening the knowledge of your students and work ethics is worth to praise for. Thank you, sir, for your guidance, support, and encouragement to all the faculty members and students. Now, may I request our worthy guest of honor, Professor Roman R. Ganta, to address the gathering with his valuable experience. Thank you. I truly honored for this uh, invitation. Um, very kind at that very short notice, all of you could uh, uh, conduct this workshop. Um, definitely, I think this is very well deserved. I will tell you in a few words. Um, I, I, I speak spontaneously, I speak my heart, that's me, that is Roman. Um, very special thanks to you, sir, the Dean, um, and all, all of you, I hear so much com so much compliments about you, sir, uh, the parastology head, that's speaking of volumes. And start with Kashmir. It's a dream place for a lot of people, including me. When I was a graduate student, I saw the old movie, Kashmir Kikali. And since then, I'm telling my wife, I think I should take you there. You should dress like a Kashmiri woman, and then we should go on the boat ride. <laughs> so that dream has come true today. Thank you for that. And, and I have seen a number of the colleagues, including Dr. Idrish, and I uh, forgot the name, sorry. I'm still sleeping. I'm st still. Everybody wanted to come back and work, even after spending two years, three years um, in US and other parts of the world. That itself is telling how great a place this is. And you are really blessed to be in a land which is always considered as a dreamland part of the India, and which is really great that you're all here. And I'm fortunate to come here. I'm, I'm one of those people like you all. I wanted to come back. And because uh, motherland, no matter where one is born, it is a, it's the feeling that comes the moment you land, the moment you reach to the place. Wow, I came to my place. 
you know, as soon as I we walked out of this uh, airport, I can see this honky, wing, wing, wing. All cars are making noise, but it's a pleasure to hear that. That's what we are, right? <laughs> That's what it is, and it doesn't matter. So just go in. Uh, no matter how hungry you if you want uh, south indian food it's there north indian food east indian all kinds of diversity just like we are so diverse culturally diverse heartfully we are diverse i i tell best way to talk about india is we're so spicy people and we're so sweet people we love sweets we love spicy food so there's extreme distance from this end to that end so that will never go away no matter uh, where you are uh, at heart, we are always from here. That never goes away. Well, why did Roman go and settle in, in America when he's talking all this? I, I went with my wife right after marriage to the US, uh, thinking that I spent there three years and come back. That was my hope. I did. I seriously came back. And I think I was uh, uh, speaking a few words. I did try. And times were different. That was 35, 30 years ago. Um, opportunities were not that great, jobs were not that easy to get. Um, but then I thought it's time for me to do uh, what's good for the science, uh, but I can still contribute in a different way. And one of the colleagues, he's not a colleague, and I, he was traveling with me from um, Delhi to Hyderabad flight. Uh, I said, I want to come back because I have eight brothers and sisters, my mom is here. Uh, my wife has only one brother. I said, this is a great place. But I said, well, where do you get the job? I said, yeah, I, I, Delhi maybe, or Bombay, or Chennai, who knows. How much time does it take for you to go from Delhi to your home? 36 hours? Those days it used to be 36 hours. Then he asked me, how much time does it take for you to come from US? I said, 36 hours? So it makes no difference. But I said, no, no, that it's not about that. Then he said, science is for science. And you can still contribute to the uh, country if you really feel at heart. There are many ways you can do that. One of the things that really touched me, and I thought I should always work, is on vector borne diseases. You might ask why. And I'm fascinated. I'm happy that there are wildlife people, there are medical students here, and uh, faculty, and also uh, veterinarians, and uh, public health, everybody's here. Vector-borne diseases connect everything together. But again, that's not the reason I wanted to be a vector-borne uh, vector disease researcher. I had malaria when I was a graduate student at Allen Institute of Medical Sciences. And I was taking medic medicine, I was fine after two days, then I got this malaria again second day 48 hours and then good medicine after six months i get it again i get it again i said no i have to work i have to find a solution to malaria that was what i thought and there is another graduate student she got a plasma in false pelomaria and she died on the spot because it was an emergency when somebody has a serious illness with that kind of a disease and unfortunately she was not given importance because there are so many cases of serious accidents and other things. High fever is not really considered as an emergency for a doctor. So, but people die. But how many people are dying with those kind of things? So, but that is what we always talk about, but still we don't have solutions to that. Well, that's not the only problem, right? vector borne diseases are very complex. Now we talk about, uh, Dr. Idris was talking about global warming, and now you, you see ticks here. There is Babesia bovis here, Babesia bisemina, and Thyleria, and all kinds of uh, tick-borne diseases are spreading, expanding. But what is the impact of those? They're impacting the emotions of the people, because in, in, in many parts of the world, they may not be the serious problem of people getting sick, but they're companion animals. And of course, the cattle industry. And I have a slide. You will be surprised to see how many outbreaks we have of above and anaplasmosis in India. Every year, 20, all the way to 100 plus outbreaks. What's the solution? So are we finding a solution to that? So that's, those are all the important things. So believe it or not, I thought the best way that I can do it is to work on vector-borne disease so that I can really contribute. But 
doing it means you have to have a translational research. That means, oh, I, I can do some great basic research. So what will that do if I'm not taking it to the application? So what are those translation has to have a good diagnostic test, has to have a good vaccine, has to have a good drug alternative drugs or drug targets. But that won't happen without having a good basic research link. So you really have to connect the dots. So we all have only so much time as a uh, academicians or a doctors or uh, veterinarians, whatever, maybe 40 years maximum. But we have to do contribute. And what one of the important things contribution is also prepare the new generation so that they are ready to take on and follow and take the torch to the next. So we have good solutions to that. So that was my hope. And I thought in a bigger picture, uh, even though I was not successful in coming back to the country, at least I could kind of work on diseases of importance to India. That's one of the things. I did work on malaria, by the way, for three, four years, but I was not successful in getting much funding to embark. But then I thought, OK, let me put more of an impactful thing. This is like an underdog. But tick bone diseases are so important. And there are other vector bone diseases which really impact uh, India and Southeast Asia, which is also, I will just touch base very briefly. So with all that, I was so happy to be part of today's uh, workshop. And I will give my talk, which is uh, science, but I will try to make it as easy as possible so that I will simplify so that everybody can follow. But what is more, it's a workshop and interactive session. Uh, if anyone, when I'm talking or even after that, um, thanks, Professor. I know we are interested in inaugurals and things like that. That is part of our culture, too. You don't see that any part of the world. <laughs> India has it. But it brings its own taste of being who we are. We are people who love to care for each other. The way we want to express is appreciate others, who are your friends, your colleagues, your visitors. I think this is the culture you don't see it any part of the world. I go go straight, give a talk. Even this morning, I'm saying 11.30, I'm just landed at airport. I will come straight to the cab campus, let's start at 11.30. He said, no, no, no worries, we'll switch it. So we are all open to understand we are so flexible people and we're so caring people. That's what is about us as Indians at this part of the world. And I'm so fortunate, I'm so blessed to be part of you today and tomorrow and the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, it's really an honor to have you here. We will have another session with Professor Roman Arganta, and that session will be quite enriching for all the participants. Now, may I take the privilege to request chief guest of today's function, man of distinct vision and knowledge, and a great inspiration to all of us, worthy dean, faculty of veterinary sciences and animal husbandry, Professor M.T. Bande, for his words of wisdom. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, respected Dr. Romana Ganta, uh, Madam Romana Ganta, my colleague Dr. Rafiq Shardar, Dr. Azmat Alam Khan, Dr. Khurid, uh, Dr. Mudassir, uh, Dr. Altaf, uh, Dr. Riyaz, then Dr. Parvez, and uh, other participants. I'm really happy that Division of Veterinary Parastology is organizing a very important uh, program that is related to the vector borne disease for their control of uh, disease, for the strategies for its control. So I'm happy to see the faculty from other uh, parts uh, of our valley, uh, from GMC, from STEMS from my uh, Department of Animal Husbandry, Department of Sheep Husbandry, then uh, Forestry Department. That means uh, we are very uh, much serious about One Health program. I think last week we had a one program on One Health program for uh, the strategies by which we can control the uh, uh, zoonotic diseases. So vector bonding are also involved for uh, the outbreak of uh, diseases 
which may be transmitted to the humans. So generally, we have a triangle for this, that is uh, humans, animals, and uh, environment. But uh, there are other factors also which are related to this. They are all interconnected, and we have to uh, work uh, in combined way so that we can control these vector borne diseases. As already Dr. Idris told, the these diseases here in Kashmir we had uh, before uh, many days we didn't had the baby shoes. Nowadays we are seeing the baby shoes. Maybe uh, it is due to the mm, uh, this uh, environmental. This is the due to the climate change. But I can tell you. One more factor is the transportation of animals from one part of the country to another part of it. And then uh, we are also responsible, like Dr. Ganta uh, Ramana, he has come from uh, USA. Maybe he must be carrying some uh, <laughs> infection with him. Uh, so we are also responsible because in earlier days, we never used to travel so much. So we were confined ourselves to a different uh, a particular area. Nowadays, it is very easy for us to travel from one part of country or one part of uh, the world to another part. So these are the also, also factors we have to keep in mind. And the scenario of these diseases is nowadays changes. Uh, previously, when we were students, we were studying the disease scenario. Now it is completed a different thing because it has passed the uh, many borders. Again, uh, wildlife is also info involved in it because of our negligence. We are now uh, going close to the forest. We are cutting the uh, trees and others. Then animals are coming down. Again, they are attacking the uh, domestic animals. So that way, all these uh, diseases, whether vector-borne diseases or other diseases, they are also uh, emerging out. So we have to think about them so that we can have a strategies for control of disease. I hope uh, today's uh, program, Dr. Ganta is a specialist. I am not a specialist in this. He uh, must be giving a very uh, good lecture for uh, these vector borne diseases. I wish uh, the organizers best of luck for this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me share with all the participants that Professor M.T. Bande has been leading from the front in all the domains, be it leadership, research, or extension. In parallel to this workshop, this faculty under his leadership is organizing a national level conference wherein participants from various parts of the country are participating. Thank you, sir, for being our role model. Now, may I invite Dr. Zahoor Ahmadwani, coordinator of this workshop, to present the formal vote of thanks. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to all of you. I, Zuhur Amadwani, Assistant Professor, Division of Veterinary Parasitology, on behalf of Organizing Committee, extend a very hearty vote of thanks on this occasion. I am sure that every one of us will have a lot to take away from this workshop. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record my sincere thanks to our worthy guest, chief guest, Professor Mohammed Tafel Bandi, Dean, Faculty of Veterinary Sciences and Helmut Husbandry, Skost K, for gracing this occasion with his presence in spite of busy engagements and involvements in the ongoing conference in this faculty. Sir, your presence has added fragrance to this event. I am highly indebted to our guest of honor, Dr. Roman R. Ganta, Professor, College of Veterinary Medicine, Missouri, USA, for accepting our invitation to be the esteemed speaker for today's workshop. I am sure that your knowledge, wisdom, and experience shall ignite the minds 
of budding researchers, students, academicians, as well as faculty members. I am also thankful to Dr. Sohasini Ganta for accompanying Dr. Roman R. Ganta to this workshop. Words, they shall fall short in thanking our worthy workshop director, Dr. Rafiq Ahmad Shardar, professor and head, Division of Veterinary Parasitology, FVSC and AH, for his constant efforts, as well as physical and mental exertion he got while shaping this workshop. Sir, you always lead from the front and are ready to take up any challenge or task, whatever is put before you. Besides being, you also try to inculcate leadership qualities to your fellow colleagues. I am also highly thankful to Dr. Azmat Alam Khan, co PI Naheb, for attending this event in spite of his engagements at 38th Annual Conference of Indian Poultry Association, which is currently going on in this faculty. Thanks are due to all the heads of other divisions, faculty members, and students for attending this event. I am highly obliged to thank our worthy participants from Government Medical College, Sirinagar, Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, Sora, Annual and Chief Husbandry Departments, Wildlife Departments, various research scholars from University of Kashmir, Faculty of Forestry, Faculty of Veterinary Science, who have all together come here to attend this workshop. Without your presence, this workshop would not have been possible. Sincere thanks are due to IDP and AHEP SCOSTK for sponsoring this event. It is worth to mention and note the help rendered by the information technology cell of this faculty in providing necessary arrangements for smooth conductance of this workshop. I am highly indebted to the organizing committee, both teaching as well as non-teaching staff of this faculty for putting their tremendous efforts in making this workshop a reality indeed. Last but not the least, I am highly thankful to the media persons for covering this event. If time is money, then today you have spent millions for us. It is indeed an honor to host you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so now we shall be moving with the presentation of Dr. Roman Ganda. So, sir. You have a presentation in your laptop or pen drive? Okay. USB. Which one you need? USB. USB. Yeah. So, by the time our IT department will set up this, I will give brief introduction about Professor Roman Ganta. He has received his formal education, BSc and MSc from Andhra Pradesh and PhD from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Then after that, he has moved to United States and worked as RA at Scripps Research Institute, then postdoc at University of Florida. And from the same university, he started his career as assistant scientist. Then from University of Florida, he moved to Kansas State, where he acted as director biology core from 2005 to 2013. He is instrumental in establishing the Center uh, of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases in 2015. And for that, he has secured a total of 1.2 million US dollars support. Currently, he is Mackey Endowed Chair Professor at Department of Pathology, Pathobiology, 
University of Missouri, USA. He has also remained on various executive council posts of American Society for Catechology, like Secretary Treasurer, Vice President, President. He is instrumental in having various extramural funded grants, uh, around 35 in number to his credit, which are worth 18 million US dollars. Besides, he has number of intramural funded grants. Uh, so he has an active and internationally well-recognized research program on rickettsial diseases impacting the health of food and companion animals and humans. His major research focus remained on tick-borne rickettsial diseases caused by the pathogens of genera Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and rickettsia. He currently has active vaccine research focus on Rocky Mountain spotted fever, fever and against several Ehrlichia and Anaplasma species pathogens, with research support from the National Institute of Health USA and from the U.S. Department of Agriculture USDA. He serves on various prestigious scientific peer review panels in the U.S. and abroad, served on uh, executive councils of two scientific societies, and is also on the editorial board of several peer review scientific journals. He has seven patents and several more patent applications he has submitted. He has a number of uh, research publications which are in high-rated journals. Now I invite Professor Roman Ganta to start his presentation. Thank you, sir. Yes. So this will be the uninterrupted talk followed by interactive session after that. And you can stay open from the US. Follow half an hour. You can take time. I prepared for 30 minutes, but I can talk. Yeah, yeah, sir, you can take 40 minutes. We are eagerly waiting for this talk since morning. Oh, okay. So you can go ahead. Is it taking you to it, sir? It's too big. Yeah, probably two MB. Almost two us. Two MB. Yeah, that's why. I... 85 percent. Yeah. It wasn't fresh, I think just made it. Otherwise, you can play straight from but he has his nose home. That's not sure. No, how did you open it? I can't understand something. Uh, double swing that. Okay, it's open. Double swing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's one. Wait. But you're able to copy it. Yes. It's nine. It's almost there. <laughs> Just click play.
Um, while this is opening, I just want to say that while I'm speaking, if you feel like I should be interrupted, by all means interrupt. I'll be happy to. This is definitely interactive session. Uh, we can interact and uh, speak and get to know more. What works is fine. So that way, both will continue interactive session where, as well as my talk. Uh, looks like it's the almost there. So often we all think vector-borne diseases mostly uh, in uh, veterinarians, not the case. But if this is a medical community, they always think that are in general public. Often they think muscular-borne illnesses is, is what is the impact indeed. Um, besides malaria, dengue fever is a big thing. Um, several uh, muscular-borne illnesses made more impact on the uh, human health over the centuries. Uh, it still does. Like, you know, on average, like uh, half a million people die each year with just uh, in parts of Africa alone, most of the sub uh, southern Africa. And so the diseases are not gone. And also, we know that the vector borne diseases are one of the most challenging for developing vaccines. Um, uh, is it almost done? I will keep talking while that's trying to open. <laughs> So the reason for that is, uh, as you know, that these organisms, whether that is uh, viral, bacterial, or protozoans, they are well adapted to vectors. Uh, vectors have a very unique uh, immune system, and they're cold-blooded animals, uh, pyclothermic animals. And uh, the contrary to that, humans and other vertebrate hosts have highly evolved immune system. It's done? Wonderful. The, Beng the Bengal tiger is what you see. I'm not the tiger, but our university is the tiger. So we're all the tigers. So uh, that is the university logo. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for all your work. <laughs> So we'll be talking about more, we'll focus more on tick-borne diseases of global importance, but I will also touch base some of the important uh, vector-borne diseases impacting India in particular, and what we should do are those future uh, doctors should uh, keep in mind they are dealing with diseases that they're really impacting, but not do many doctors know that they uh, have an impact. So like I stated, uh, my philosophy has always been like I mentioned before in my general talk, we only have so much life. That, as Indians, we know that very well. Um, in short span of life, uh, when, when we have our own academic life or whatever, uh, that's even smaller. So what do we do that is impactful? Many ways, if we are doing research, that research has to be impactful, and so we can translate better uh, the impactful that we teach them to the new generation so that they will be impactful to do that or if it is doing a very basic research, then what is the best way that we or somebody after us will take it to the next level? So this always has been my passion. So you will see that in my talk as well. So why study vector-borne diseases? Um, as uh, we all know that they continue to have a major impact over, over the centuries of the human death toll, which is very well known, all the way from yellow fever to malaria to uh, dengue and all kinds of diseases that we know. Not only that they have, uh, like filariosis, for example. So this, it's never gone. So there are a lot of parasitic diseases. So so the malaria parasites can, uh, I mean, the uh, mosquitoes can have a parasites, uh, can be transmitted as well as the um, protozoan parasites, or even bigger parasites can be transmitted. We know about that. So the, the toll is always there. but Few people know, uh, other than the veterinarians and others, that this is like an underdog. Um, wait a minute, what happened? Oh, I have a tick, it's gone, no problem. Tick is an underdog. So the tick-borne diseases are very well known uh, for 
their impact, but they were never well appreciated because they're not really causing a human toll. But believe it or not, they are causing a serious human toll because they, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, people live on milk and meat. That is their lifestyle. If you take a one animal out of their life, basically their lives are gone. So they basically, you know, we have this dowry system. Their dowry system is how many cattle you bring. Uh, how many cattle, is, if the cattle, something gets sick, they die, their life, lifestyle is gone. So that means they have a direct impact. Like uh, the companion animals is the same thing. So this was very well recognized by many, all major US uh, funding agencies that we have to focus more on back to bond diseases. But if you go back about 50, 60 years ago, uh, National Institutes of Health is the human uh, work where I got a lot of my funding. Uh, the director of the NIH said that, what are we going to do after 10, 20 years from now? We may have to eradicate National Institutes of Allergy and uh, Infectious Diseases because particularly anything to do with infections, vector bodies, everything will be eradicated. He was so confident that vaccines will be developed, drugs will be developed, and so they won't. And you go back. Um, we are at the same spot, and there are more and more and more new diseases are emerging. And till very recently, which I will show you in the next slide, that the I only have these many slides. <laughs> yeah, see, maybe you can uh, do that. Um, so there are uh, this something is missing. It's, it's fine. Um, here is the long list of tick-borne diseases which are identified um, during the last three to four decades ago. And once the humans were hit with the tick-borne diseases, the entire US uh, 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 healthcare industry and people and research, it was, no, 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 we need to work on tick but solve the problem of tick-borne diseases. So if you look at in this list, uh, I just color coded that little bit so that you can see the first top, all yellow highlighted is all tick-borne diseases coming from the bacterial infections. In the middle, there is a babesiosis, which we talked about, Babesia bisemal bovis, which is a protozoan parasite. So human babesiosis is also transmitted from the ticks. And then if you, the bottom list that is in the blue, these are all viral diseases. Now the question is, how come, and if you see in the, there are like four columns, right? The sec second is the etiologic agents. Third one is the Tick species where you see, you see the same colored, uh, you see that amblyoma americana, uh, which is the factor for four or five different pathogens. Same thing, oxodes capillaris. So you wonder why that is. That's where the wildlife people will also have something to appreciate. It's because, oh my God, the slides are not complete. <laughs> so the ticks, You, you can't plug in directly and... Uh, yeah, I can play. It's a Mac. Doesn't have a USB with HDMI. So the tree. Uh, does it have? Can I wirelessly stream? Is it? Uh, you have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Wi yeah. 
I can do that. Wi-Fi the question. It's my question. And just let me like a yeah. One plus nine out here. No, no, one plus nine out here. One plus nine. One plus nine. I didn't refresh. One plus one. That's the name of the Wi-Fi? Yes. One plus nine. Oh, I'm looking for that. Presentation should be the presentation he was to present to our working Hello? Let me present it. Okay, sir. I will email it to you. Hello, sir. Presentation here is Susan Chalaki. You know, Susan. So you have to save it as a PDX. Oh, when you say that, please say it. You want people to touch your hand, help you. Live mother show put in.
I got it. I got it. <laughs> All right. I think now we're in session. Uh, uh, we can <laughs> proceed now. So yes, uh, why study tick-borne diseases or any other back bodies? I'm talking about that. Uh, this is a now well-recognized problem because now it hit people directly. Then there is an attention. Uh, before 1970s, uh, when there was Lyme disease, was not discovered. There was not much funding also to do research on all these uh, tick-borne diseases in the U.S. After that, um, all these departments want to fund. Um, that's because it, it, there are so many human cases. But that's a good thing uh, because the research, once you start, uh, it translates into other fields. That's one health concept, obviously. If you're finding a solution, obviously, uh, you can directly work on humans. So you do start with animals as animal models. And the tick-borne diseases are very unique. Um, you will know that, why I mean. But before I go, I want you to know what is a tick. Let me, give me a second and see if I can play this video. Um, I guess not. Let me escape for a second. Uh, the, that is a video there. I think I can play. Picture. It only came as picture. No worries. So no problem. Because we switched to the different presentation, I guess it's uh, I, I can take care of that. Yeah. So what you're seeing there, I really hope that I could show you this video. This was the uh, gut pulled out from the tick. We put them in the culture media. We left it there to see what what happens? This gut is squeezing and contracting and still working just like as if you just pulled out or just a live tick. So the, what I'm trying to tell you is the ticks are very unusual bugs. They're very well adapted to uh, living in very difficult environments, uh, even in uh, harsh climates than they, they can do. Is that, are you able to do that? Just no problem. Yeah, don't worry. It only came a slide, so because I think when we converted it, uh, it lost its, uh, um, yeah, let's not mess with it. So at the end, we'll, we can see if we can pull that out. It's not that important. So I already talked, so many tick-borne diseases came into existence, which is also what I w want you to take the message from here is that ticks can pick up many pathogens, and then they can harbor these many pathogens and then pass them on. The one wonders, especially if you're uh, in a wildlife or the a veterinarian, how do you, which disease that we're dealing with? Why these pathogens surviving into these ticks? What is it giving the ability? And why in the first place ending up in the ticks? These are all the questions, right? So for that, one needs to understand how the ticks lifestyle. Ticks are not like, uh, you know, the interruptive feeders. They need a blood meal completely for their survival. So the, there are four stages. Once the uh, mother tick lays eggs, these are not just 10, 20. There are like 5,000 to 10,000 ticks, depending on which tick species. And then they can feed literally any animal that they come in contact because they need a blood meal. So if they pick up an infection, it was bacterial, viral, or even multiple infections, the pathogens adapt to those ticks, and then the infection progresses to the next stage, um, which is called nymphal stage. And the nymphal stage, at that point, they can be transmissible to cause disease in other animals, or they can pick up new infections, and then pass it on to the next one, which is adult stages, male and female. When the female um, is fully matured and lays the eggs, some pathogen can still go from egg to the uh, larva. So that's called transovarial transmission. So organisms were adapted very well, and the pathogens can easily go into tick because ticks are picking up blood meals from many different sources.
So they don't have to wait for their specific host because they don't care. All they care is a blood name. It can even be reptiles, can be snakes, turtles, elephants, no matter what. So that's where you have to understand the biology. That is the key, right? Otherwise, you can't really have a solution easily. So then we talked about rickets cells. I will be focusing more today on rickets cell diseases. How many of you know about rickets cell diseases here? Few hands raised. A lot of people don't know what are rickets cells. But if you look in this picture here, these are intraphagosomal bacteria. They are replicating inside the phagosomes. When the bacteria is engulfed inside the macrophages, neutrophils, whatever, whatever the host cell, that's where they are started replicating. But if you see more close, some of you might know what those are, mitochondria. So they are of the same size as mitochondria. And in fact, they're close cousins of mitochondria. So rickets cells are like a mitochondria. So my, what is mitochondria? Mitochondria is obviously bacteria, symbiotic bacteria, which lives in us. Thanks to my mom and thanks to all of your moms, we're breathing today because Moms are giving mitochondria to the offspring, children. We all get mitochondria from mother. So mothers give more than just taking care of us. Even in the genetics, they, we bring more, thanks to all those moms or future moms. So mitochondria is a kind of a rickets cell, so endosymbiotic. So an organism comes, this is generally uh, first time you know, encounters in a host, basically they are they don't know what is this host, and the, the host doesn't know what this is. So that becomes serious battle between them. That's where the disease, so incidental hosts are. When we get a sickness that's like a COVID, first time comes, we get a serious disease, right? Because our system doesn't know this. That's how the pathogenic organisms they become. With time, it's not good for the pathogens also. They, with time, they come to good understanding. Like they lose some genes, maybe they adopt themselves, they're less virulent. So they become moderately infectious, but they don't cause serious disease. With time, they better live together harmoniously. That's where we call them endosymbionts, so like a mitochondria. So there are several rickets cells which are also endosymbionts. So the, some are highly pathogenic in some hosts, but not others, because we they are not really well adapted to these hosts, like people and animals, they're not really well adapted to these infections, so they get serious illness. Like I said, we focus more on rickets cells. There are several rickets cell diseases of significant importance, but if you see where they are living and how they're causing the disease, like the first one, Ehrlichia chefiensis, one of the first human uh, Ehrlichiosis pathogen discovered in the US, Identified in humans, but it also causes infections in dogs, white-tailed deer, and number of other uh, animals. Same thing, Ehrlichia canis, most of the veterinarians know canine Ehrlichiosis pathogen, but also infects people. Same thing with other pathogens listed here, Ehrlichia ruminantia, previously called Cordy ruminantia, which is a heart water disease pathogen. And throughout sub-Saharan Afri Africa, I don't think it is there um, in India, but that causes severe devastation in the cattle industry and uh, all ruminants in particular. If you move to the right, there's another group of organs, Anaplasma species. Anaplasma and Ehrlichia are very similar, like I showed in the picture before. Those are all intraphagosomal bacteria. And Anaplasma marginal, I will spend more time today, is one of the very important pathogens which impact the cattle industry throughout the world. So there are others, the uh, bottom right, Rickettsia species, Rickettsia, Rickettsiae, and Oriensa sachiganda highlighted for good reason. Rickettsia, Rickettsia, you don't even see those infections uh, here, but these two groups belong to the Rickettsia family. They are different from the early can anaplasma, anaplasma family pathogens, because they are escape the phagosome and they replicate inside the cytoplasm. That's the major difference. Then why Oriensia is important? Those of you who are in medical school are progressing, keep that. Look at this triangle. This triangle is called scrub typhus triangle. This is where you see Oriensa Sachigamishi infections, also known as scrub typhus disease. This is a serious human disease with uh, deaths anywhere between 40 to 50%. 
This is not transmitted from the ticks, but chiggers, chigger mites. And they are all over India, and a lot of people die. All I know every time I come, I, I ring this bell. Those of you, please pay attention to this disease. Uh, speaking of that, I came also to attend one of the conferences, which is going to be held in Mahabalipuram. They will talk a lot more about this disease. But it's a serious disease also in India because it kills. You see that the red color. So those of you considering to going into vector-borne diseases, please consider this as a good project. Um, we do work on all the highlighted uh, pathogens. We have basic and translational research. Uh, but today I will be sp speaking a little bit more on early Keshefiansis and how the basic research from the Keshefiansis is translated into anaplasma marginal. And I want to talk about that because anaplasma marginal is important disease. And I want all of you or some of you to work to solve, the, um, uh, come up with a good solution for that. And I'll be ready to help if you guys need that. Um, little more about these uh, Ehrlichia or anaplasma. Basically, they enter into a host cell by phagocytization, and they metamorphize to uh, replicating forms. And then ultimately, they are escaping as exocytosis are complete lysis. And these are the infectious form, and these are non-infectious form. They're also called different names, reticulate cells, dense core cells, and so on. So what we have been doing for the last 20 plus or 30 years is uh, 25 years, I would say. We have been trying to understand what is the ability, how these organisms are causing pathogenesis. And so for that, we need to understand host and pathogen and the vector. All three needs to be important. So if in this circle I put, Pathogen in the middle, but there is a tick, and there is an incidental host, like a dog as an example, and a reservoir host. So if we want to study and come up with the solutions, we need to bring all those uh, factors come to the picture. Like you want to solve a problem, you have to know everything, right? So that means you have to do the research with everything and a real infection. So that's what I believed in. So we have research to investigate host pathogen interactions, and what is the immunity exerted by these infections and how they're failing to overcome uh, clearing these infections. That is another area. And that ties into bacterial unique gene expression. So bacteria know uh, they express proteins in the uh, vectors and different proteins in the vertebrate hosts. So what are those essential proteins? How, what can we do with it? How do we find those essential proteins and then take those out and see, can we come up with the good solutions? That's where the next project, which is a mutagenesis. So mutagenesis is a method by which select tool you can take or knock down a gene. And if you do that, can we develop translational vaccines? So that's what we have done. So today I will spend more time explaining how we use the mutagenesis as a way to develop vaccines, not for one pathogen, but several pathogens. So mutagenesis, our genetic tools, is not very easy for obligate bacteria. You might ask why. If you can do that in E. coli, why not? Because like I mentioned, there is a reason why these are obligates. If my son is living with me even after he's 17, 18, or 21, there is a reason he's living with me. He needs my money or something else, right? So he can live on his own. So we call them as parasites. So the pathogens are living in a host. That means they need something. How? Why do they need something? Why he needs something? Because he's not competent. Thank God my son is competent. He's a good job. It's not an issue. Uh, so, but some people do that. That's because they have some deficient. Maybe they lack good education, like that. So here, what is in these organisms? They lack certain genes which can support their lifestyle, say energy equipment, essential nutrients like micro, micronutrients, like just zinc, metal ions, and all those things. So how do they do that? They scavenge from the host. So because they lost some essential genes. So that's why mitochondrial genome is much smaller. We know that. But it's very essential for us to breathe. Uh, but it gives both. So we exchange. So the mitochondria survive on us, we survive on it. Same thing here. So long story short, with that, so essential, most of these obligate pathogens have only kept essential genes. If you have only essential genes, then you knock out a gene, what happens? The bacteria die, 
and we can't do anything. So we don't know how to do that. So that requires very careful experimental design to come up with a solution. What did we do is that we tried a random mutagenesis approach. What will that is that randomly you are introducing mutations to knock down certain genes. So you might ask, randomly you create a mutation, probably the bacteria might still be growing. That is the only thing you want to see, right? So actually, I raised that to my colleague, one of senior colleagues. I said, what good that will help? Oh, Roman, you can still learn a lot. I said, OK, let me try that. What we have done, here is what it is. Because if you're growing the bacteria in cell culture, there is no host response. There is no host immunity. So there are a lot that the bacteria can survive even if you create mutations. So first, I thought, OK, if we can, first of all, if we can create mutations, then we may have a way to identify sources to fine tune methods so that we can target disruptions can be accomplished. So that's how we started. But believe it or not, we learned a lot more from simple random mutagenesis. That's what you see here. All these black dots represent one mutation at a different location within the bacterial genome. So then we map those to the genome uh, which is the uh, chromosomes of the bacteria, we identified there is no bias. There are mutations within the genes inactivating or mutations outside the gene. They're almost 50% equally distributed. So what that is telling that even though there is a reduced genome, not all genes are critical and you can still make mutations. So then we carefully designed experiments to fine tune the methods of targeted disruption of a specific gene. I will tell you how that benefited down the road. So our first question is, what happens if you take all this pool of mutation library, put them in animals? So we developed animal model, which is mimics the natural reservoir host, in this case, white-tailed deer. So that means we read the white-tailed deer in the lab. We inoculated these mutation pools and tested which mutations are cleared rapidly which mutations sustained. Because all the tick-borne diseases, one thing about them is they persist in a host for long periods of time. So by the process of elimination, we identified a long list of genes using in the na natural reservoir host. Then we developed a similar protocol with an incidental host as an example, canine host, dog. So you might ask, what is the difference? Because we do know that there is a serious disease in an incidental host, but not in the reservoir host. There may be differences between them. How do we dissect that? So that's why we developed this protocol. This is, it takes time to develop all this because it's not um, straightforward. And there's another factor that goes into it. People feel very uncomfortable working with animals, like dogs particularly, because of emotional bond and other things. So we have to convince the reviewers that we do careful working and all those things. And then how do we study what is the impact of a gene on a tick. Because if you're putting them into the animals and you put the ticks, they're already clear from the animal, say suppose, then if they're not acquired by the ticks, then we can't really tell what is essential with the tick. So we came up with another protocol so that we can selectively test the impact of the infection or loss of a gene on the tick. What we have done is we allowed the ticks to feed, to engorge, like a nymphal stage ticks, because if you take the engorged ticks, allow them to mold for, it takes three weeks to become adults. But if you take those engorged ticks and you need to inoculate these pathogens, or mutated versions, they should not progress to the adult stage and cause transmission infections. So that way we can precisely identify genes critical for the bacteria for its survival into the tick. These protocols really helped us to identify many essential genes. And if you see all these highlighted, some are biotin biosynthesis, some are protein biosynthesis, some are DNA biosynthesis. There looks like very straightforward uh, things would make sense. OK, probably the bacteria is depending on the host for all these requirements. There are several more which are membrane bound, because membrane is the contract point for the bacteria with the host. So then next question we asked, OK, this is good. We know what genes are critical, what proteins are essential. But what good it is if we don't solve the problem? First of all, you need to know the biology, why these are essential. Some are obvious, some are not. 
And secondly, can we come up with a good solution using these uh, knocked out or inactivated or replication defective mutated bacteria? So for that, what we have done is we selected these attenuated bacteria to see if we can develop vaccine. So I lost a little bit of highlighting during the transfer. So here are the three we selected, um, like 230, 379, and 660. These are the names of the genes. We randomly selected them. And not randomly, there is a good reason we selected them. All three encode for a membrane-bound protein. One is a pituitary. They don't have a real biological function that we, can, we could define. The second one codes for antiporter protein. Basically, antiporters are like proton pumps. Bacteria lives inside the acidic phagosome vacuole. So still, they want to be pH 7. They want to be neutral. So that means it has to have acting pot and pump to pump all the uh, ions so that its environment is not acidic. I thought, OK, it's an essential gene. That's why the, this became a defective. The third one we selected is another membrane protein, but it's a phase-related protein. What is a phase? Phase is a bacterial virus. So we know there is no bacterial virus for these organisms. What is the phase protein doing? So I thought, OK, let's see what we can do with this. So first of all, we took the animals. We inoculated with these three different mutation, mutant bacteria into dogs and checked what kind of immune response they are developing. The first one barely developed any immune response. So that means the second one gave moderate host response. The third one gave a stronger immune response. It's the B cell response and the T cell response that we measured. So even though those are all replication defective, there are different outcomes. So that means not all else is like, like today I saw these beautiful apples here. The apples that you eat from Kashmir are not the same as apples that you eat from Andhra Pradesh because there's something different in those apples, right? So the taste where they're going. Same thing, even though these are defective, there's something different that host is ref responding differently. So what is that? And now second question we asked is, OK, low immune response or moderate response, which gives the best protection if we challenge with the wild type infection. So we found the first one gave barely any protection to no protection at all. Second one gave a moderate protection. The third one gave the best protection. So yes, OK, what's the difference? Then we have looked at what's going on with this and why the third one gave the best protection. That's where the basic research come into picture. First, we have compared the protein structure of these mutations to the wild type. Here are the controls. And then we compared the mutation, that antiporter protein. When we create a mutation, complete protein structure is modified in the bacteria. So that means the host is seeing a completely different kind of bacteria for which it induces immunity but when the wild type comes it's not it can't really recognize that on the contrary to the one the phase protein gave pretty much the protein structure is very similar so that means when we created when we deleted the gene it it basically kept the bacterium intact just like a wild type if the host sees a wild type bacteria it induces infection uh, response the response is immunity and if the protection has to be targeted to that, right? So that means this particular protein defect is giving a perfect immune response, which is protective. Then we extended that studies a little further. What is phase protein? So like I said, phases are viruses that infect bacteria. That's what we call the bacteria phases. So on the right in the panel A, what you see is a regular phase. What it does is it sits puts inserts it's like a tube-like structure it pumps its genetic material into the cell and it kills lytic cell cycle and all those things bacteria we're all smart including the bacteria and virus we all adapt ourselves to the different environments when i i came here i thought it is going to be cold i got i came prepared with a jacket right so the bacteria prepare to what the bacteria do they take some of these viruses they integrate them as part of the genome, so they're integrated. So now they're no longer lytic, but they reverse it. So as you see it in this B. So that means it is using its own proteins to send it, our genetic material send it outside. It's in a, why is that important? Now think about these obligate bacteria. They need to get nutrients. What is the best way? You need to have a channel. 
communication. It's a bridge through which they can take nutrients that send some chemicals like proteins. They can go and topple the host cell so the host cannot induce the immune response. So you go into the bacterial history, bacterial genetics. There are all kinds of secretory systems which are called type 1, type 2, type 5, type 6. Those are all nothing but the viruses integrated as part of the genomes. That benefits, like if it is the type 3, type 4, type 6, what it is, look at that, there are three layers, because gram negatives have two layers, and the third layer is the host cell, uh, host cell membrane is in the phagosome. So that means it has to pump through all those. So then we looked at what the gene that we found, how does that similar? Well, we looked at some Vibrio cholera has a gene structure which is very similar to our bacterial mutation that we created. We found that not just one gene, but there are several phase genes are present. We reason probably these genes may be part of one kind of a secretory system which helps the bacteria to send its proteins out. So that's what we predicted. And there is a postdoctoral science, two of them worked hard and identified so this gene protein makes some kind of ring-like structure and it helps the bacteria to acquire micronutrients, zinc and uh, iron. So when we created a defect, so the bacteria struggles to acquire metal ions. So that means they can't replicate. But it looks otherwise very similar to the white. So then we look, okay, so this looks like a good vaccine candidate. Do we have similar genes in the other bacteria? All those rickets will have the same similar gene structure. The protein that we are working on is also present, conserved, and present. We thought if we can make a vaccine for one, if we can extend that met metagenesis protocol that we developed, which is a targeted disruption protocol, we can extend them, then we can have a vaccine for every different organism. So indeed, we were very successful with early cash affiances, and we demonstrated one year protection protection against tick transmission, product, protection against uh, IV infection. So then we extended that to bovine anaplasmosis, which is caused by anaplasma marginal. Why is that an important one? Like I said here, it's major economically important tick-borne disease and can cause also up to 30% of um, losses, mortalities, and cause huge economic losses because of milk and meat production throughout the world. Okay, it's, and it's not like other ticks, it has some unique things. It, it's transmitted from number of 20 different uh, tick species they can transmit. If you look here, uh, this, is the, this makes sense to me, I'm left-handed. So this other through the, from uh, anti-clockwise, you have to look from uh, the reverse way. So here's the blood infection. When the ticks acquire the infection from the gut to the salivary gland, so ticks and the ticks transmit to the cattle. So it is the erythrocytic infection. So that means it is in the red blood cells. So, but they can also transmit mechanically. So mechanical procedures that people use it throughout the world, like uh, dehorning procedures, tattooing, and you know vaccinations, all the procedures when somebody has a huge cattle farm, they're, they're not very careful with all these procedures. But that's a big, uh, you know, ground for the infections to progress very well. So this particular pathogen is very well adapted to that. So there is initial uh, high acute phase, then there is a persistent maintenance of the infection throughout the life cycle of an animal. Okay, now I say why this is an important disease to work, besides it is the worldwide problem, it's definitely India problem too. India is the biggest milk producer in the world. I think some of you or most of you might know that. Um, the highest milk produ producing country is India. And this is this came to me as a surprise. This is the World Animal uh, Health Organization so, uh, report. Uh, if you see that India's outbreaks of bovine anaplasmosis, 2005 is 14 and kept increasing to 108 in 2014. I don't know how many beyond that we don't or don't have the data. What that is telling is definitely it is taking a huge toll on Indian economy for which we need to have a solution. I wish this video works. 
this was on August 15th. Um, Prime Minister of India said that he committed, I think, 15,000 crores for, it said, vaccines against animal pasudan. Uh, I think that's the word he used to improve it. So I'm telling you, some of you are interested. There are a lot of projects that work. This is one of the important projects. You can easily convince that this is the funding that you can work on to do that. So that is the video. Unfortunately, I'm not able to click here. I think it's changed. Maybe at the end, I will try to open it. So we, I move this very quickly in the interest of time. Um, there are two ways that you can control the um, uh, anaplasmas in the world. Some parts of the world, there is a live vaccine, which is anaplasma centrally, but you can use it everywhere. I don't know it's available in the US, India, but definitely in parts of Africa because it's central is. So what that is telling heterologous infection works. So that means if you have a vaccine, which is a live vaccine, which works very well for all different strains. I will talk why strains are important here. The other thing is that there is a modif inactivated vaccine, which was in the market in the US and took, uh, or taken out. There is a commercial uh, like, you know, trial vaccine, still inactivated vaccine. It doesn't work. Why? Because when we tested the samples, independent of the uh, vaccine used, independent of the drug, which is a chlorotetracycline. How many of you are familiar with chlorotetracycline? Aromycin? How many of you know that that was discovered by an Indian? Indian named Y. Subbarao, Yalla Pragar Subbarao. He discovered that on our campus, right across from my office. I always look at that field, uh, field uh, uh, 23. So he pulled out the aromycin, um, which is a chlorotetracycline. Still, it is widely in use to control bovine anaplasmosis. But no matter what, whether you use it or not, the infection still persists. So here is an interesting map that when we studied in California, you see that there's here is like almost 80% infection. The, this is uh, the yellow is almost 80% and purple is no infection. So there is no real boundaries right next to each other. There's some with almost 100% infection, some with no infection. So that means the practice, how the farmer, how the uh, cattle, uh, um, management is done, herd management makes all the difference. So that means you can control the ticks and you can reduce the infections or don't bring animals from other parts of the world, you can still reduce that. So there are ways that you can do that. But what is more is no matter where we collect that sample, 50% of the animals are positive for an average for the pathogen. Here is an in interesting thing that we came up with. And this is, let me skip in the interest. And when the infection increases, number of strains that you find are also increasing. There are a lot more strains are circulating. This is one of those bugs, like 200 plus strains exist. So that means you have to have a vaccine that should work against all those vaccines. Obviously, you can't have a vaccine targeting every specific vaccine. But our scientific reasoning is that since anaplasma centrally live vaccine works, if you have a live vaccine for one strain, it should work for all other strains. So here is an interesting thing. One of the Missouri uh, farmers reached out. He said that he has been feeding them with chlorotetracycline. These are the beef cattle, but animals are dying. So we found out that 50% of the animals are still positive for the pathogen. And when we measure the CTC values, anything above the five uh, nanograms per ML, there is only uh, one strain. And below that, you, you can increase this number of strains. So what that is telling us is that strains, by giving the uh, tetras, chlorotetracycline, we are breeding the antibiotic resistant uh, resistance in the animals for this pathogen. How many different drugs are there? Not many. There's only one more drug in the market. Still, that doesn't effectively clear it. So definitely vaccine is the way to go for this. Okay, this is, I'll uh, skip. We have done this also at Kansas. Okay, so what's the uh, innovative approach that we can use to do that? Like I said, there are vaccines that can work. The best vaccine that can work is the live vaccine. That's where 
we came up with the targeted disruption vaccine, which we already showed it for early cash offenses. Then we extended creating the targeted disruption mutation. It is the uh, mutated version, which you can uh, identify by color. And then because this is the essential gene, which de uh, depletes the uh, bacterial survival, we thought this is the best vaccine. And that's what we have done. Um, we wild type infection, whether it's IV infection or needle infection or tick transmission, animals develop a severe disease. But we vaccinate only once, and then after four weeks, we challenge animals that help. There are a few parameters that we tested, like packed cell volume, basically the red blood cell infection disease. There is a huge drop in packed cell volume with an infection. That's what you're seeing here. On the contrary, when we vaccinate, it's pretty much restored. There's still little drop, but this is above the normal range. So the animals are very healthy. And you can, same thing, you can measure the uh, um, a spike of uh, infection, which is pretty much flattened after we vaccinate. And the same we have identified, um, this is the different uh, assay. Tick transmission, same thing. Here we combine the data. Here is the non-vaccinated animals, drop in pack cell volume, but restored when we vaccinated them. Here is the comparison of um, um, parasites, uh, um, anaplasma, drops down to almost to undetectable levels, to lower levels. So the vaccine really works. There are other parameters where we observe. There's uh, enhanced reticulate size, reticulo sites, uh, enzocytosis, which is the enhanced uh, increased size of RBC and a lot more clear band neutrophils. That means a lot of immature uh, neutrophils, same thing, immature lymphocytes and all those things. Everything is improved when we vaccinate them. Okay, so we already demonstrated that modified live vaccine works for Ehrlichia and anaplasma. Now we are extending similar studies with anaplasma phagostophilum, one of the important pathogens, infects people, dogs, horses, and cattle. So we, this is still work in progress, but we could clearly demonstrate that the vaccine also works. So also works for Ehrlichia cans. So that means we identified from our basic research a solution for the solution for several tick-borne diseases, particularly the kid cell diseases. So we have several funding um, from these uh, two major sources of funding to investigate the understanding the basic biology or pathogenesis, as well as to develop vaccines against Ehrlichia and anaplasma and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which I didn't touch base because that's more of a disease in the US and uh, Western Hemisphere. So we also have work in progress on Ehrlichia ruminantium. I believe that the human Vaccines against tick-borne disease may not be that critical, but vaccines against cattle are ruminants, and maybe the dogs may be more critical. So I think this is the application that I think uh, is a valuable uh, even for our setting. A lot of this work was done by several of these people who used to be in my group. Now they're all moved on to their own academic careers. And very recently, Professor Anish Yadav also came and spent, and he was part of the three vaccine studies. He got engaged when we were working. He came at the right time when we were starting the project. But with that, and here is my active group. Besides me, I have an associate professor working in my team. And there is Sohas Niganta there. And there are three postdoctoral scientists. Two of them happen to be from India. And there are one from Africa. And the bottom three are PhD students, and the last one at the bottom right is a master's student. So there are about 10, nine to 10 people in a given time. So everybody's busy enjoying their work and making some progress. So I think I took you for a ride with so many different things in this talk, but let's interact and uh, discuss more if you still have any energy left. Thank you. Thank you. 
I just speak in speaker. And they share the borders. What I could observe, we were correct. And second, uh, the vaccine has been developed by your laboratory in 2022. But still, it is not to the India, and we are still suffering in India because of this disease. Uh, still in India, the prevalence is high. The vaccine has already been developed by your laboratory. Oh, well, it is still work in progress. So I think uh, we are now working with the, uh, can you guys hear me? It's working. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, we, of course, one of the important things for any vaccine is to take it to the market. So that requires a commercialization. So we are right now working with a commercial market. And we also filed a patent uh, in several countries. I'm not sure we, I think they celebrate India. I'm not sure definitely all the way to the um and many countries uh if that comes into the market probably we will have events that's what we're hoping uh but it's a long path because the way the industry works probably all of you are familiar unless they think that they they can make money they're not interested um, uh let me tell you if you don't test you don't find any <laughs> that does <laughs> That doesn't mean it's no good. That's a no good. It's 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 a no good. And like with the California, what the, they're very, they're not very for me. Some of the people's, huh? How do you explain that? Huh? You can still be infected, but they haven't followed that. Hi. Thanks for saying that. Can I also really uh, good talk from you? We really appreciate your work, especially for the development of these vaccines for you know, these tick-borne diseases. So this was a quite uh, information to us. Uh, basically, uh, we see here that, uh, in this Kashmir part or in India, uh, the rickettsial inf uh, infections are emerging very fast, especially those uh, that of sacrifices or uh, supported uh, fever and supported and uh, Typhus group. These are very uh, typhus. Yeah, these are very highly prevalent. These are safe because uh, we have been working with the Sri Kashmir Institute of Medical Science Technology. I'm a professor who are here. I'm working with my student over here. Here we are working with these rickettsial infections. Uh, uh, we will we will I will go to tell you. The concern was the, that the basic uh, the theme was that we were not really. Uh, diagnostic these diseases, though yeah. the tests were available with us, were ELISA based tests, and it was uh, IFA, IFA tests. But sometimes, usually, the patient get infected, and we don't know uh, if uh, the doctor class 